Okay, full disclosure right off the top, recording here, midday Tuesday. It's uh, it's going to be a cranky show. I think you're probably cranky on your end, watching, listening, whatever you're doing, because Patriots are 1-6. and six. And look, I, I'm not here to root for the Patriots. I'm not here to root against the Patriots. I'm not just here to watch football right and report about it. And the job, if you do it well, is to hold the mirror to what you watch. What we are watching is a massive mess. And when we play, naturally, the blame game of whose fault is it? Oh, is it the players? Is it the coaches? Is it the front office? Is it ownership? When it's this bad, is everybody. Everyone is eating at the blame buffet. Now, I am going to go in today, as you can tell by the headline of this episode, uh, in on Gerard Mayo, as I did after the game in a column that said, basically, look, the Patriots have much bigger problems right now than losing. It's coaching. It's culture. It's comments coming to me from players like Kendrick Bourne and Daniel Ekwale from London. Travel Tales coming up at the end, by the way, to end this on a high note. Um, And we'll get to Pat's Jags film notes, offense, defense, (laughs) special teams, and um, we need to talk. But before that, again, if you want to go and yell about ownership uh, or the front office, by all means. This episode today, though, is about Gerard Mayo. Because in my view, this is his mess. Okay? He's the head coach. He's the one presiding over this six-game losing streak. Longest in the league. He's the one in charge of the run defense that he declared after week one would always be good. And has since allowed 167 yards per game since week two. He's in charge of the running game offensively that he told opponents, hey, you're going to have to stop us. Oh, and that same running game the last two weeks has been led by Drake May, but not on purpose. By scrambling, he had a team high 18 yards against the Jacksonville Jaguars and then 38 yards against the Texans. This is a team averaging more yards rushing when it is trying to pass than when it actually hands the ball off. Mayo is the one in charge of a team that has regress because you know Drake May just submitted the two best quarterback performances of the season and the Patriots lost both games by 18 points on average they're taking more penalties they're committing more mental mistakes and they're actively getting worse in a way they just got bullied like this is (laughs) this is going to be a simpler film review this week because when you look at what happened on defense there wasn't a whole lot to be learned. We can split the blame pie and well. I got a lot more stats and all the stuff we normally do here. It used to be a Monday, but it's a Tuesday. I got back, like, back late from London last night. But none of it is good. And all of it goes back to the head coach, who also said the Patriots need to better support the quarterback and now hasn't in either start, either with a running game or protection. Now, we're not here just to call out the problems, which again, it's not more obvious. You got your ass kicked at the line of scrimmage. We have a few solutions, and they are for Gerard Mayo because the biggest news, aside from the comments I got from Kendrick Bourne and Daniel Ekowale, which we'll get to here in a little bit, was him calling the team soft. A comment that he has since walked back because he said, oh, we're, we're not a soft football team. We played soft. And if you're familiar with Mayo's work in the media right now, it's uh, it's not uncommon for him to walk things back. So suggestion number one, is to be more prepared with the media. Bill Belichick, he's going to come up a lot, if you haven't if you haven't been able to tell. When we talk about Gerard Mayo and this Patriots start, he used to take 10 to 15 minutes before every single press conference. Muted, same old, consistent Bill Belichick, who folks would always say, oh, this is why you say nothing to the media. No, you, you can say whatever you want to the media. I would say just be more consistent. What Gerard Mayo has not been, has not been consistent, because he's not prepared. Okay, And I wrote this column in March. People familiar with my work will remember this. The headline was, Gerard Mayo's growing pains coinciding with the Patriots. Yeah, that's holding up, I would say, here in October. The intro was about him spilling orange juice. Which, look, you want to make a little joke about Belichick and the memes at the owners' meetings because that's where this column was written. And Gerard gets a little laugh at the start and 10 minutes later spills it on his pants. Well, that was emblematic of stuff he had been doing already for weeks. And here was the quote in the early in the column. Quote, the affable Mayo charms his audience and delivers a memorable quote. It's an instant PR win because every word he utters and every move he makes is contrasted against Belichick's cold, muted style. Then time passes and Mayo sits in a minor mess of his own making. Well, end quote. As we've covered, this is a much bigger mess. And it's not just about PR. And I don't really care and didn't then how much he says to the media because, of course, he's going to lie. He's a football coach. This is what they do aside from coaching football. The issue is when you're messaging to the public, to people who on the fan base are actively rooting for you. And that even goes for some of the folks in media. I'm not going to lie. There are definitely some in those press conferences 
hoping the Patriots win every single week. Okay. If you can't get that messaging straight at a time that you are only up there for 15 minutes, how can I trust you as someone uh, covering you or as a fan rooting for you that you can get your messaging straight to an audience of something upwards of 70 men who you are in charge with motivating and organizing and leading? And here was the end part of the column. Quote, the next time Mayo proclaims the Pats will extend themselves or he lays out a grand vision. Who won't pause before believing him? The danger is not in deceiving or angering fans. Dot, dot, dot. The danger lies in how Mayo's messaging reaches his players, assistants, and front office members, especially as a new head coach. How will they receive their new leader reversing course on burning cash or committing to a quarterback? If he's already walking back comments to the media during what he accurately described as a honeymoon phase, how firm will expectations be inside the building? Can you build trust like that? No, the answer is not. And it's not just the burning cash, and it's not about the quarterback plan, which he waffled all throughout the summer and has since now talking about when they decided to turn to Drake May. Was the offensive line considered? Was it not? It's now about calling them soft, which is not great in the first place. Some coaches do it. I would advise against it. And then walking that back to say, oh, that's not really what I meant. Well, say what you mean, because your words matter. And not just to me, a media member who will be here win or lose, okay? It matters to the players in that locker room. Calling them soft is not a way to earn trust with you or to get them to play harder. And, of course, Bill Belichick sprinkles a little salt in all these wounds now that he's a media member. And that's his job, to be critical, to do what I do, is call it like he sees it. But we know Belichick didn't want to leave. Robert Kraft admitted last week in a PR mess of his own that he fired Belichick. He said that. Kraft did. Okay? But Bill's right. They're not soft. Most of this roster was here a year ago, and the Patriots are missing key players and Christian Barmore and Jabril Peppers and Juwan Bentley, and I do not trust Bill Belichick to be a reliable narrator on this game. And again, he's salty about how things went down and will revel in all the failures for Mayo. But Mayo is making this too easy, and it also undermines his credibility. Walking back comments, again, about burning cash, the quarterbacks, now messaging to his team, not to mention the lineup changes he talked about last week, which leads us into our second one. Because, well, let's stop for a second. When he's talking about players being soft, let's get something straight. This is not just an insult at them. That is a boomerang of blame coming back at him. Because as is often the case with coaching, you are either coaching it actively or you are letting it happen. So if you had a soft team, that didn't just happen Sunday in Jacksonville when the Jaguars called 16 straight runs and ran the ball 17 straight times, including a Trevor Lawrence scramble. They showed up soft and you led them in that building. That's on you, not on them. Uh, as far as being harder on the players. Okay, so Mayo says last week there are going to be lineup changes. Well, let me tell you this. After uh, looking at the snap counts and, and reviewing the film, there really was just one. And it was Raekwon McMillan, an adult in that linebacking core. Okay? And I thought McMillan deserved to be done. So get me wrong. Um, but where was Jalen Polk? Because he told Mass Live last week that in a where he's caught two passes and 10 targets, that he has the best hands in the league. Oh, okay. Well, then he goes 0 for 3, including two passes that hit him in both hands, and leaves the game. And then posts on Instagram with a peace sign. What does it mean? I don't know. You know who else didn't know? Gerard Mayo, who said Monday morning he hadn't talked to Jalen Polk. Well, I don't know, Gerard. If that player did indeed leave with a head injury, as the Patriots reported, maybe you want to check on him. Maybe you see what's going on. Maybe you take a second in the cross-Atlantic flight back home to see what's up understanding that if he's in a difficult mental spot, which Mayo alluded to again, by the way, in the press conference, and doesn't seem to be uh, having an effect positively on Jalen Polk, I would ask, and maybe Mayo was lying. Again, if Polk had a concussion, you definitely would think some member of the staff would check on him and at least relay that to Mayo. Maybe not. But here's the thing. Polk is not the only one in that receiver room to have been, I would say, immature with their comments. And it's a young group. It's Pop Douglas who walked them back. Keishon Booty, he said, oh, we need to be more aggressive, as we talked about last week. A guy with as many game appearances, as healthy scratches, feels like he's someone who deserves to have a say in what's going on. Um, but that's what happens. Young receivers want the ball. They're going to they're gonna speak their ways. But if I'm the head coach and not a media member who is rooting for honesty and transparency, and tell us your thoughts, not in a way because it will be scandalous or anything like that. I just want to know what you think. Okay? But if I'm the head coach, enough. What good are all these comments doing? Be firmer with them. Tell them that if you were going to speak, realize that you were speaking for the team. 
okay? Not just yourself. Represent the whole team in a way that you would want to be represented if someone else was speaking for you. And defensively, what good is it to air out some dirty laundry? Again, we on the outside should all be rooting for honesty and to knowing what they're thinking. But these are suggestions for Mayo to be firmer with his players. Jalen Polk probably shouldn't see that much playing time based on his production, his comments, or either of them. The receivers need to reel it back here if you're going to drop passes or only have one catch against man coverage, which they had against Jacksonville after the opening drive, mostly because Pop Douglas went down, he was sick. But Kendrick Bourne from that same receiver room is also saying, hey, maybe you guys shouldn't stay up as late at night. Maybe they should eat things they are going to have us better prepared on game day. It's true. That's personal accountability. As he put it, it's personal decisions to make. But it starts at the top. Either, again, you are coaching this or you are letting it happen. That comes up to Mayo. Defensively, I said again, what good is it for them to air dirty laundry? Well, Devon Hachow says uh, three weeks ago, guys were playing selfish. We're like, oh, listen to this. That's pretty good. I mean, it's bad that he, he felt the need to say that. But maybe it'll let it fire. Uh, no, 190. Three rushing yards versus Miami, 192 rushing yards allowed the next week, and now 171 versus Jacksonville. So no, guys being called out is not having any effect. And I might have a reason why. From Daniel Akawale, quote, I feel like a lot of guys think too highly of themselves and have to check their egos and come in and just play as a team. That's what he told me. I tend to believe him. But they probably wouldn't think that highly of themselves had they been told and informed in a way that we know Belichick probably went too far sometimes with those low lights? I don't know. If the stats aren't getting to them, if the film's not getting to them, the head coach either needs to change his message, okay, or the way he's delivering it. Be harder on the players. Number three, be harder on yourself. Make the coaches stay later. Players stay longer. Now, granted, I do think there's a point of diminishing returns of these football coaches studying, pouring over film until 2 a.m. It makes for a great soundbite. makes for a good story on my end. But at some point, the film is the film. With all the data that you're given and you could pull, you know, automatically through all these different services, okay, there's not that much more to be seen. It's great that the coaches get out uh, early, mid-afternoon on Fridays now to spend time with their families. I would encourage that if I was a head coach. I'll be your one in six. This is inexcusable if you're the Patriots and you are getting outscored in the first quarter, uh, except for... Sunday, which was great. They led 10-0. Oh, but what happened after that? You got out-adjusted. You had no more answers for a Jacksonville team that just showed up and punched you in the mouth up front. And with the media, Mayo, be harder on yourself and your staff. Get a little bit more detailed because the players think you could do a better job. Here's Kendrick Bourne. Quote, I think they're just figuring it out, he said of the staff. You know, they go on day by day, week by week too. So we've got to be better in every area. Players, coaches, everybody's got to be better. So there you have it. Be harder on yourself. Be harder on your players and be more prepared with the media. I told you a month or two ago, I was sick of talking about Mayo's messaging with the media. I want a real football. Well, we got it. They got problems. This is coaching. This is culture. This is stuff he's allowing to happen if he's not coaching it directly, which he said he's not coaching them to be soft. And I, I believe it. There are a lot of hardworking, even ex-players on that staff that know the kind of toughness it takes to win. But they're not getting through right now to a young team that sounds immature, and is playing even worse. Granted, the roster talent is the worst in the league, uh, but that's just what it is. Good news. Drake May is not in that group. That man handles himself with the media. That man throws for two touchdown passes, and we will get into his start in one second before I tell you a little bit more about game time because game time, I don't care if you're, let's be honest, probably not going to a Patriots game anytime soon, but you might be wanting to go to a concert or a show or a Celtics game. They tip off tonight. Banner 18 finally going to the Raptors. If you are going to any game or show or concert coming up, Go to Game Time where they have the lowest price guarantee. And if you find a lower price elsewhere for any ticket, they'll credit you 110% of the difference because they've got all in pricing. They've got seat views. I told you for weeks, I just used this. My wife and good friend, Jaguars fan, we'll forgive him, who went to the game on Sunday had outstanding seats. And I found them at Game Time because they were cheaper than anywhere else you would find them. And you should too with Game Time Picks that filters out all of the fluff where you think you might have a cheap seat but then you don't because you get all these little pesky fees. You don't have to waste time searching and figuring out those fees. Just go to Game Time and use Game Time Pick. So download the app today. Create a Game Time account. And use code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. And then create an account. Redeem code CLNS for $20 off. Again, the Celtic season is here. That's a winning team. Go down to the garden or find somewhere that they're traveling. Just download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. Okay. 
on to Drake May. So, uh, Drake May, pretty good. I gave him an A-, minus for that starting debut he saw against the Texans. Most of it was context and a rookie curve. It was a top-10 defense he faced in Houston, carved him up for three touchdowns, had a boneheaded interception. Kind of picked that into my expectations anyway. Uh, here, he does not have an interception against the Jaguars, a defense that allows a ton of yards versus man-to-man, a ton of yards off of play action, doesn't force turnovers, takes a ton of penalties. And honestly, I thought Drake May certainly didn't deserve an A-, minus, probably in the low B range. A little bit of step back. Here's why. He was flat-out lucky to avoid an interception. He had one more turnover-worthy play against the Jags than he did against Houston, including a couple picks that had to be broken up. He was uh, less than accurate on passes between 0 and 10 yards of the line of scrimmage, which is basically where the Patriots live right now, given their protection issues. He threw an accurate pass on fewer than 70% of those downfield attempts, again, between 0 and 10 yards, not that far. He also wore down, I think, a little bit under pressure. Now, there were moments like him ripping that 22-yard touchdown, third and 15, closing pocket to K.J. Osborne to keep them alive late. He did extend multiple plays in that second scoring drive where they got a field goal. Uh, One was a scramble, and another one was a first down conversion on Hunter Henry, who ate 92 yards. And overall, again, this is very good for a rookie who had zero benefit of a run game and honestly forced the Jaguars to change their game plan. They came after him with as many blitzes in that first drive as he saw on dropbacks the rest of the game. I just thought there was a little bit more meat left on the bone. And you saw this with some of their play action. We talked about this last week. He finished three of six for 17 yards in a sack. Some of that was Jacksonville having great coverage downfield, which we know the Patriots opponents. For some reason, I haven't cracked this code because it's not by formation. It's not by personnel. It's not by quarterback alignment, whether he's in the gun or whether he's under center. They seem to know when they want to take these shots uh, versus when they want to run. But May, with those play action drops, where he turns it back to the defense, makes a play fake, and then looks again downfield, often at a different picture. It's new for him. It's not just being under center. It's making more reads and understanding what he's looking at could be different from the defense. And if he's covered, what do you do? Because the Patriots ran multiple plays with max protection in just two routes downfield. And if they're covered, that's not his fault. But there should be ways that the Patriots get more than 17 passing yards off of six dropbacks on play action. So I thought he played well enough to win just not well enough to carry his team to victory. Again, a couple of misses that you just go, where the hell is that one going? That's a bug in his game, okay? This was a B, B minus game, despite him going 26 to 37 for 276, two touchdowns and 18 rushing yards. You know, again, a little bit better under pressure, a little more accurate and shorter throws, a slight step back, but still better than you would expect generally for a rookie quarterback, especially given the offense he's been forced to carry. Let's be clear. Drake May still very much doing more for the Patriots than they are for him. Uh, critical areas. Patriots finished with almost an identical explosive play rate as the Jaguars did, which is after turnovers, the second most telling stat as far as winning or losing. Here's the problem with that. They didn't have an explosive play until the fourth quarter. They had a success rate, meaning how often are you just staying on schedule? 34% of the time. The Jaguars obviously beat them over the head with their running game and stayed on schedule in a way that was uh, more than impressive. Their success rate, 58%. Absurd. And the Patriots had one successful play. Okay, talking about 40% of yards to gain on first down, 60% or more of yards to gain on second down, and 100% on third or fourth down, because you get, again, you just got to keep moving the chains. They had one play like that in the second and third quarters. And some of it was Jacksonville just eating up clock, but this is an offense that can't stay on schedule, can't generate explosive plays unless it's made just chucking the ball downfield. Jacksonville did both. Opponents are doing both. This was more of a route statistically um, than, than it looked in the end on the scoreboard. Now, Patriots started well. They had nothing lead. We saw that. That really happened. So what happened next? I don't really know. But in addition to Jacksonville backing out of some of their blitzes and passing downs, which again, just three blitzes after that first drive as far as what Drake May saw, uh, Alex Van Pelt backed away from his play-action plan, which I didn't get. Again, they didn't generate a ton of yards, but eventually this defense was going to break when you look at giving up the most passing yards and most completions up against play-action compared to any other defense in the league. He called four play-action throws, Van Pelt did in the first drive. And he called four the rest of the game. And he insisted instead on running the ball, specifically on first down. The Patriots had one successful first down run in the entire game. That routinely put them behind the chains. So they did miss DeMario Douglas, who, oh, motion at the snap, look at this. Uh, Beat man coverage on that first drive, third down catch. And 
they had one such catch against the defense. It doesn't play a ton of man, but illustrates how the receivers are the prime. Are they are they getting enough separation for a ball from Drake May against man to man? Not really. You saw it. the numbers back that up. So the Van Pelt was limited in what he wanted to do, but I just didn't think stuck well enough with the things that were working in that opening drive. More motion, specifically against man coverage, more play action, and movement throws that Drake May did really well with, including one that Jalen Polk should have brought in. But again, flatly is just not bringing balls in through contact in a way that he should. Um, the other issue, these offensive guards were terrible. Okay, Lane Robinson goes down. He told me after the game, it's a, quote, slight sprain, but he wasn't a walking boot. City So comes in. City So I had down for four pressures allowed, most among the team. Second, Michael Jordan, left guard. These guys got stonewalled when they were trying to run block. They were leaking pressure when they were stepping back in pass protection. And Jordan also gave up two run stuff. So had one. The team had one. It just all around wasn't good enough. And Michael, one who gave up a sack in a hurry, and he's flatly not living up to that $57 million contract as a right tackle. Um, but it, for me, looking at this tape, it started with the guard play. And Jordan's been better generally than you would think for a guy who's bounced around in practice squads and played for the Panthers and Bengals who both said, nah, no thanks. But City So playing this poorly is a real bummer for a guy who was a starter all throughout camp, then got hurt and really hasn't played since, but maybe that's due a little bit to health. Uh, no, this was just flatly terrible performance. Granted, he's been playing mostly left guard this this year and going back to the summer, and he was at right guard on Sunday. But th this is just intent. I mean, even the most mobile quarterbacks are not dealing with that kind of interior pressure over and over again, and certainly not creating any yards when they hand the ball off, which the Patriots overall running the ball, 8.3% success rate. Is a run-first offense. No, 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 it's not. It's a run-last offense. It's a running-nowhere offense. And that's mostly due to the offensive line. But shout out to Michael Hasty, who played the best of any running back on Sunday. Rondre Stevenson came back at 18 yards, only forced one missed tackle. Hasty had five. Very good in the passing game. Good in pass protection. You like what you see. But aside from him and May, that was about it. Because again, they're not generating explosive plays downfield. Oh, Hunter Henry gets a, a thumbs up too. Um, unless it's just just chuck it, which is what they do to Kayshawn Booty. And to Hunter Henry, who came down with a contested catch in the middle of the field. Jalen Polk's not there, 0 for 3 on targets. KJ Osborne comes off the bench. Great job on that 22 yard touchdown. Not still getting separation, though, versus man. And it's just it's just an issue all the way around. Um, Patriots have to be better. The offensive line is a mess. And the fact that City So coming off the bench is, should have been one of their best linemen going into the season, as bad of a game as he did, whether by my charting or look at PFF. It's just really discouraging because the late Robinson is out. I mean, you're not only just running out of tackles. Demontre Jacobs going from left uh, left tackle to right tackle and left tackle again. I thought Jacobs was pretty good. You're running out of guards, and we know what they have at center, and it's just really, really not good. But it wasn't as bad as what we saw from the defense, which we'll get to in a second because, again, whether it's football season or basketball, if you want to make a little bit of money, even as your team might not be winning, go to Price Picks because this is the simplest, best, and, in fact, America's number one one game when it comes to daily fantasy sports you can make your picks in less than 60 seconds okay and win up to 100 times your money with price picks here's how it works you look at all of their player staff projections again basketball football uh baseball we still got going on with the world series and you look at them and you build a lineup and you go more or less on those staff projections put them together file them away that's it and if you sign up today you will get $50 instantly when you make your first deposit. You don't even need to win with your lineup to get the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. The way you do that is you download Prize Picks today. Use code CLNS to get that $50 bonus instantly after you play your first $5 lineup. Again, up to 100 times your money with as few as four correct picks. My picks, don't ask, not great. But football, basketball, baseball, hockey coming up. Go to Prize Picks. Run your game. Okay. Defensively, this one was simple. Uh, they got their butts kicked. It's personnel, it's coaching. This was one of the worst linebacking performances I have ever seen. And we can talk about, you know, how much of it was Mayo's fault. I spent a ton of time doing that. But the fact of the matter is, I don't know how many teams would have defensive tackles like Eric Johnson, waiver claim from Colts, or uh, Jaquel and Roy, second on the team in, in sacks, by the way, too, playing like they are for the Patriots. But that's who they got. And they're getting manhandled inside. And when Devon Godchow, joins them, a guy who got stood up by a tight end on that lost touchdown run for Tank Bigsby. Uh, Dietrich Wise also got pancaked by a tight end for the Jaguars. 
nothing is going to go right. There is no easy fix here. And you talk about how bad the D tackles were. The Jaguars averaged 5.9 yards per carry when running left between their center and left tackle. This isn't about setting the edge. This isn't about anything more than D tackles doing their jobs and linebackers fitting the run behind them. Speaking of those linebackers, I called it one of the worst I've ever seen. Jelani Tavai running himself out of place, missed two tackles. Christian Ellis, first career start for the Patriots. He had 10 tackles. Most of them were Tank Bigsby meeting him. Okay, There was no force here that you felt like he was playing with, meeting guys in the hole. The Patriots don't have the personnel, but they should be coached better than this. And so I look both, as we talk about Mayo, at new defensive line coach Jerry Montgomery and Dante Hightower. Because the problems underpinning everything that happened are just that. They're fundamental. Okay? Run fits. Block destruction. Fulfilling your assignment and gap discipline. These are no longer givens for a defense that, as Mayo said, should be always good against the run. They're not anymore. Okay, and Rayquan McMillan, who got benched, missed one tackle and 11 defensive snaps. That was the only big lineup change here. Josh Uche played 11 defensive snaps, mostly because they were in dime personnel just seven times. But th there's, there's nothing good here. It's the personnel. It's the coaching that's clearly not getting there. And the linebackers need to stay true to their gaps. The defensive tackles need not to get turned around. Um, like they're getting out of way if someone's trying to squeeze by at a, at a tight aisle in the grocery store. It's all bad. And Devon Godshaw wants the lone bright spot here was as bad as any of them. And he has to play across the line and he's not getting a whole lot of help and he's getting tired, but it's 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 no good. Uh, Christian Gonzalez gave up three catches. All of them pretty tough. All of them to Brian Thomas Jr. I thought he would be better. Still obviously at fault in the 58-yarder, but it's hard to time your rip any better than he did against Thomas, who just held on to the ball anyway on that deep ball that we saw from Trevor Lawrence. Um, couldn't jar it loose. The first touchdown, Marcus Jones, I think, was at fault in the coverage bust. Patriots were in man-to-man -man on the left. Jacksonville had a bunch set with three receivers, very tightly compact. A lot of defenses will form a box across from that. And so the two corners or defenders at the bottom of the box in each corner will say, okay, I'll take the first receiver who goes my way. You take the receiver that comes your way. Two at the top are doing the same thing. Okay, high left, high right. Bottom right, bottom left. Three of those guys were forming a box. Marcus Jones was not. He was playing some man-to-man. -man. Bryce Thomas comes over the middle. Touchdown. I will say the one player who did have a good game in this defense, Jonathan Jones. Didn't give up a single catch. Had a great stop on that first drive and tackled well. He supposedly gave a fiery address to the team in the postgame locker room, as well he should, because uh, this was an embarrassment, as was, as was the touchdown return, um, as we saw, for 96 yards just before the half on the punt team. Okay, so what happened on the punt team? I, look, I think flatly Bryce Berenger just outkicked his coverage, and a guy who takes the ball at the four-yard line probably surprised everyone in that coverage, which is what Parker Washington did. But that dude had a runway well up the middle of the field, and Berenger boomed that in the air, 76 yards. Very impressive. Would have won a lot of contests if we were playing punt, pass, and kick. Uh, they were not. They were playing NFL football. So once Brendan Schooler, who was you know affected by – um, the vice player in his area, and then blocked secondarily by another player from Jacksonville. No one else was close. The other gunner, because that's where Brandon Schooler is, furthest outside player running down the field to cover a punt. The other gunner was Marcellus Dial, who was beat downfield. Not supposed to happen for guys with 4-4 speed. We're not playing any on defense uh, by four teammates, including Schooler, downfield. So you have one gunner getting close. The other one's not remotely close. A ton of space in the middle. Not that hard for Parker Washington to go straight up the gut. Everything else, though, in special teams, fine. Berenger dropped all three of his other punts inside the 20. Patriots and Jags had the same, the identical average starting field position. The problem was Jaguars kicked their ass up front uh, on both offense and defense, and that was it. Okay, two more segments, and we'll get to Travel Tales. We need to talk. This is the opposite of game balls. This is like, hey, come step into my office. And I already said their names because the personnel is what it is. The Patriots are going to have to wait until the offseason to replace guys like Jaquan and Roy and Eric Johnson, who are now big players in the middle of their defense, as well as Daniel Quale, who, by the way, was also not great in this game, but is going to surpass his career high for snaps played in a single season on Sunday against the Jets as soon as he plays his 21st snap. Let me say that again. A Patriots starting defensive tackle, typically a pass rushing specialist, okay, who's now been forced to play early downs because they have nobody else, is going to surpass his career high in snaps played for a season Less than halfway through this year. 
It's mismanagement from coaching, front office, all the way down. Oh, and by the way, his pass rush stinks too, just as the whole Patriots pass rush did. And I'm glad I came back to defense for a second. Here was the bigger issue. No sacks, no quarterback hits, no pass deflections. Patriots had four total pressures. One from McQually, one from Keon White. A schemed one from Marcus Jones, who couldn't wrap up in a blitz in the second half. And Kyle Duggar, who came free on him blocked, which is really not a credit to him. It's more scheme. That's it. Four total pressures. You can't win like that. Uh, Patriots hung around longer because Keon White and Jaquelin Roy actually showed some desperation in these big spots, which I think also reflects Patriots not playing as hard as they could. Keon White got a pressure on Lawrence's last drop back, incompletion third down, forced the Jags to punt the fourth quarter. Roy tosses the center aside on that fourth down stop that no one thought was going to be made, and Jaguars were just going to keep pounding the ball, but instead turn the ball over on downs. So uh, pressure, is, it's, just, it's just not existing. So anyway. Uh, but we need to talk. Jerry Montgomery and Dante Hightower. They're the only new defensive coaches in charge of a position this year. I get that they have bad talent to run with. And part of this, again, is injuries. Christian Barmore's gone. Juwan Bentley's gone. But this has not been good. Basic fundamentals, when those lack, reflect back on coaching. Jelani Savai was a much better player last year. Christian Ellis is probably better than he's ever been. This isn't good. Raekwon McMillan's certainly been better in the past. And it's just not good enough. These are fundamentals taken for granted. When you're watching the Patriots run defense, even by Mayo, who again, in week one or just after week one said the Pats would always have a great run defense. Right now, it's the worst in the league. 167 yards allowed per game. It, commit guys to the box, teach better block destruction. I mean, this this is this is bad for Jerry Montgomery and Dante Hightower right now. All right. What would NFL film say? Um, you know what? They probably start on a Monday or not a Monday. On Friday, Patriots get into London. There's a lot more in this fictitious hour-long documentary about the season, which is going to have negative viewers at this point, but we're going to continue on with the segment because that's what we do here on the show. And it's a player's at the Harrow School practicing, Mayo talking about new dynasty. Cool. Maybe a new location, new practice schedule, new starting lineup changes are going to spur them to victory. Well, here we go. We get to Wembley and nothing start. Drake Mays touchdown pass. Joey Sly kicks a field goal. Great. Uh, then they're going to cut to Megan exact. Then you're going to see the Parker Washington touchdown falling all the way back into the end zone. And then Tank Bigby pounding and pounding and pounding away. And then that's it. This is another game where they spend maybe 30 seconds on in this recap of the season so far. Uh, Jags 32, Patriots 16. And obviously some sort of like British cliche or nod at the end of this, because that that's, if it's Patriots produced or it's produced for the Patriots, they're not going to spend a whole lot of time in football on this trip to London. All right, Travel Tales, speaking of London. Uh, so I got in on a red night, a red night, a red eye Wednesday into Thursday. Uh, traveled with my wife, met up with a friend who came a day later. It's a Jags fan, one of my oldest friends. And we took a taxi into West London where we stayed in Kensington. And a couple behind us when we're in line outside of the airport. Uh, shout out to Tim, a history teacher at Mansfield, Mass., and his wife who said, oh, we're going to the same hotel. It's Marriott Kensington. Great area. Very, very nice area in West London. And uh, I said, oh, it's a work trip for me. Why don't we expense this? You come on in. So we took, thanks to traffic. Which, by the way, London felt very prepared having sat in Boston traffic as often as I do going to and from Foxborough because this was an hour ride. And thankfully, our taxi driver doubled as a tour guide around London and had been for years. So we're getting a lot of historical facts, information about the Premier League, the Harrow School where the Patriots practiced that Friday, which was like 35, 40 minutes northwest of the city and uh, sprawling campus. I'll get to in a second. So he's he's giving us all this information, ask, answering questions. Very, very nice guy. Um, and get, kind of getting closer to London, whether you were in a more residential neighborhood like where we were, we were in Kensington, you know, it's just so densely populated. And I'd been there 12 years ago. So this was not all brand new to me going into London, but it just felt like regardless of whether you're in Kensington or some rougher parts that are outside the city, it is so densely populated. More residents in New York City, in London. It felt like if you farted, five neighbors would know. Like it was so, everyone is so on top of each other there. Anyway, we get to the hotel and load our bags. It's Marriott. We get there, except for um, our, our new friends, Tim and his wife, not staying uh, at our hotel because this was the Kensington Marriott. We were at the Kensington Residence Inn. So after a long flight, long taxi ride, take a 20-minute walk over to the hotel, drop our stuff. Uh, I need to write my column on the Friday 5 and did that. Wife takes a nap. We go pub hopping. And one of the facts that our taxi driver had told us is that a lot of them have 
recently, not um, recently, but you know, in the last 10, 20 years, were bought up by one of the more popular breweries in London, Fuller, and they had refurbished them. So you knew if you saw a sign that said Fuller atop one of the signs for these pubs that it would be well run, well taken care of, clean, and have a similar menu. We found out there's another such chain, Green King, um, that had also, I don't know if they're uh, in any way associated with the brewery, but another chain of pubs here in the city. So we go, okay, we'll pub out. We go to Handsome Cab, Elephant and Castle, and Church Hill Arms, all real names for bars, and had a lovely time. I didn't love the beer in England. I'm not a beer snob, but the Camden Pale Ale was my favorite, and that was by a great length. I did love, though, more of the pub culture, which is just very relaxed. Everyone's there after work or to hang out. We were out probably like 3.30 to 7 or 8, uh, got some food, called it a night early, and went to bed. Friday, got up, recorded this podcast solo, took the tube to the NFL Media Hotel, which was further inside the city near the Marble Arch. The Media Hotels, by the way, when the NFL you know, buys them out or rents however many rooms, they're like 400 a night. So I've never stayed in them for a Super Bowl, for a big game, the comma, any of this, okay? But it does have a shuttle. So I get there, see a lot of guys uh, and girls who were on the beat, Mark Daniels, Chris Mason, Chris Price, Koyang, Yang, Mike Reese, Godfather, uh, Chad Graff, and a few others. So we get on the shuttle, takes us to the Harrow School, which is this all-boys boarding school. I talked about this a little Friday. And um, sprawling campus, very old campus. They had, and I'll go back to this, filmed a scene from Harry Potter there. Like that that, that kind of tells you what, what you need to know. So uh, we get into the media room, which is a – <laughs> a gym that looks like it was straight out of my elementary school had I grown up in London, like the rubber floor, a bunch of, um, you know, basketball hoops on the, on the walls. And they have a very, very nice setup and, and food and drinks, very gracious hosts. Like I, I always feel like it's too much when we show up at different events like this. Uh, like I just need a place to sit, a Wi-Fi, and that's it. Anyway, Mayo speaks, Drake May speaks. Neither of them want to talk about, you know, the injury with the knee. That's fine. We go to the practice field and it was converted from obviously a, a soccer pitch um very well set up they have all of their marketing partners who are there sipping wine in this giant tent crafts on the field we stay for a little bit longer than we normally do but it's a friday practice walk through a lot of individual drills nothing too too crazy javon baker's the only one missing he's ill we don't even see him on sunday in the game come back right more press conferences christian gonzalez and hunter henry and i'm asking guys like you know dry mayo just told us before practice we're building towards a new dynasty do you ever think about that and a surprising amount of them and guys that you would you know, if you, if you listen to their press conferences and I've talked to them personally, like they're pretty authentic when they have a mic in front of their face. And Hunter Henry said yes. Ramondre Stevenson said yes. And other guys said no. But um, it was interesting because you think here, OK, one and five, you can turn it around a little bit. Jaguars are the get right team in the NFL. Of course, it didn't happen. But it's something they're thinking about. And I think if you're a fan, you're at least happy to hear it's not any kind of consolation these guys are looking to really refurbish and restore the franchise like they got a ways to go i think they're worse off right now than they probably were a year ago but it was curious to me so we asked about it anyway um we wrap up there get back in the shuttle they offer to give a tour of this room where they had filmed this famous scene from harry potter in the first movie uh where the kids are all learning charms and it's just got you know rows of wooden benches on the edges you've got a wooden seat up at the front Again, like everything about this screams, this is from centuries ago. And everyone but Mike Reese wants to go. So I'm like, Mike, you have to go. So Steve Burton, who was there, uh, goes and films, gives a whole, um, you know, Steve Burton experience. He's just so gregarious, outgoing. It's just one of a kind. And they're filming spots of, oh, this is where Harry Potter sat. And on the wall, they had all the boys who went there back in the 1800s and early 1900s were allowed to carve their names in there. Like this is not the stuff you would find in the bathroom when you and I were in school. It's like, oh, that wasn't allowed. Like, no, this is, I was here. And among those names was Winston Churchill who went there. Benedict Cumberbatch also went to the Harrow School. So anyway, we're uh, we're leaving. And this is probably around like 5.30 or 6 by now. And uh, Mike, who, who did not want to go, he's just not a Harry Potter fan, comes out, Steve Burton, because they do TV all the time, obviously at CBS, starts to interview him about what it felt like to watch Harry Potter and be in the same room as Harry Potter and forget Winston Churchill. Uh, and Mike has to go on the spot with the camera rolling for a future show. I think it was probably their pregame on Sunday, about how connected he felt to the room. And so I take a picture, send it to him. We're laughing. We get back on the bus and it takes, I don't know, like 40, 45 minutes. Um, get an Uber back to our hotel go out that night with uh, my wife, my uh, Jaguars friend who had finally arrived, Mark Daniels and Chris Mason. We go to four pubs, all of them highly recommended, still in the Kensington area. The Queen's Arms, Gloucester Arms, 
again, these are these are pub names, um, where we spotted a, the Mets Dodgers game walking by, and we just watched one inning. We were not the typical Americans, like, you know, I'm gonna go over there and, and try to have everything I do at home. But hey, there's baseball on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna peep. Uh, we also got crop dusted in a way that I have never experienced before in my life. It traveled with us. It was it was like disorienting. Uh, so if you want to know maybe why we only stayed for an inning or two, that was it. Then we go to Greyhound, which was a rare bar in the area, which again, it's just West London, you know, nicer part. It's not why we chose like residence in. Uh, I think it was probably the cheapest Marriott I had available to me when we booked, but that place was open till midnight. There was one last pub open after that called Prince of Wales. And a lot of these were of the Green King chain that I talked about before. So the beers offered are very similar. Same with the liquor selection, the food, but it's all very well kept up. It feels homey. Uh, I talked about this probably when I was in New York, you know, that kind of like dark wood, wooden taverny feeling. So it was great to go out. We left about one uh, from Prince of Wales when they closed down, got back one thirty. nothing rowdy, just good to be out, hang with those guys, have a pint uh, over and over again. And uh, Again, the only go- good one, in my opinion, was the Camden Pale Ale. Of course, had a Guinness, sampled some other drinks, but just, you know, it was, it was solid. Different story when we were in Germany, I'll put it like that. Saturday rolls around. Uh, I had no luck getting tickets to two Premier League matches. Very new to the EPL, not an expert. One of them was in Tottenham, which is north of kind of central London. Um, that was a bit out of the way. Fulham, which is a smaller club, the oldest, I learned, which is in a place called Craven Cottage, which is right on the Thames. And they had a match. Bob Sosie went. Chad Graff went because Bob had a hookup with the Jaguars who helped him get a, a seat. And that's relevant because the cons, who own Jacksonville uh, or own the Jaguars, also own Fulham. So they go, had a great time. I skipped it. Uh, my friend, my wife and I, we go to instead a play at the Globe Theater. Saw a comedy of errors. Awesome. Highly, highly recommend this. Now, I didn't realize that that current theater had been built in 1997. I didn't think I was stepping into the 1500s, but everything there feels as authentic as possible. If you want to just go see a show, feel like you've stepped in a time machine, that delivered. The acting's phenomenal. There was some audience I want to say like involvement, like you're pulling people out of the crowd, but there's a lot of wink and nod. The physical comedy held up. Uh, just, just, just very, very cool to go and experience. We basically walked back through central London after that, a lot of walking uh, down by Big Ben, Parliament, um, and stopped in a couple more pubs, of course. One was the oldest Irish pub in London. Go back to 1605. And then a place my uh, my buddy who knows a lot more about the Premier League than I did recommended that we stop and watch the last game of that night or last match of that night uh, before we go to Soho which is a, number, a neighborhood, it feels like every major city. Anyway, to see the Broad Street pump, because my friend who works in epidemiology uh, knew that this is where the cholera, out, some cholera outbreak in the 1800s had started. And it was finally discovered that that was the source, this broad, this pump on Broad Street was the source. But he wanted to go check that out. And naturally, the pub right behind it is named after the scientist who discovered that, uh, John Snow, who actually knew something. Shout out to the Game of Thrones fans. So, very cool, relaxed. Uh, Saturday leads into Sunday. Uber to Wembley. This is also 20, 25 minute drive northwest of West London. No parking there, really. Uh, and it was a little bit more built up outside than I would have expected. Uh, or it was it was newly built up, I should say. Like if you've been to Fenway in the last five years, it feels like the apartments that went up there recently give it a very different atmosphere. But look, Wembley is a cathedral of international sports, only home to the English international. Uh, or the men's national team, women's national team. And that's it. There are no Premier League teams that play there for all of their home matches. And of course they do other big events and, you know, things like that. But just, a, just a, my bucket list does not include, you know, stadiums in England. But if I had been a little bit more cultured whenever I last updated this bucket list, Wembley would have been on there and it was an absolute treat uh, to be there. By the way, walking in uh, between my wife and my friend and I, Checked off all 32 teams spotted in terms of jersey representation. So this crowd was awesome. Uh, outdoor press box, which I love. Again, very good care. Just just way too nice to the media, I would say, as far as treatment. Uh, visit with my wife and my friend, who had, again, great seats, shout out game time. And a guy stops me as we're walking around the concourse to say, not like, oh, hey, go Pats, or, you know, seen you on TV or done this. It was, hey, tell Felger to suck it. Uh, so tweeted that out. Yes, tell Felger to suck it was my <laughs> fan interaction or of a couple that we had in England, which honestly probably consists of my 30% of my interactions out in the wild. Nothing to do with the Patriots. Just, Hey, next time you're on TV with this guy, tell him he sucks. Uh, the game was what it was. Wembley spectacular. Again, the crowd, the stadium, if you have a chance to go highly recommend it, not a cheap trip, not an easy trip. Feeling very grateful that, you know, most of this was expensed in the locker room afterward. 
go in to talk to Pop Douglas. We're all watching going, uh, what the hell is, is going on with him? Which the team did not report until I had asked PR because they're very good about relaying injuries and keeping us updated. But when he was just on the sideline, I'm going, he should be playing. KJ Osborne's not supposed to meet in this game. I ask. They say, oh, he's got an illness. He confirmed that. Dude looked incredibly sick. Um, I wrote about it, tweeted about it. Same with Kendrick Warren. Talked to Keyshawn Booty, Ramondre Stevenson, and then Daniel Akawale. So wrote up those stories. Met them for a pint. One last pint at the Torch. This is a bar uh, that is about 14 minutes walking away from the stadium. And this is where you get a lot of like the new apartment buildings. You're going by some shops. Obviously, a big train station. And then uh, took an Uber back to the hotel. Wrote my column. Finished around 1 a.m. local time which no one can relate to this. But if you work still in a newspaper somehow in 2024 and we have these deadlines to get our print edition out, which people still read, uh, it's nice not to be totally under the gun to write something so that you know you you don't have as much time as I would if working for a website. So anyone anyway, finished that up at one local time. Monday, flew back, watched film entirely on the ride home, got back very, very late last night and uh, pretty much crashed at radio this morning. And here we are. So that's it. Um, not as cranky as when we started, but the Patriots in one and six are now going to try to play, believe it or not, spoiler against the Jets this weekend. Uh, we will have a guest later this week for our second episode. Be back on a more of a regular scheduling program with Pat's interference. If you have not yet rated or reviewed or email me, a Callahan at bostonherald.com, please do. We'd love to hear from you, what you think, and all of the five stars help as we kind of grow and try to give you a good show here as the season continues to spiral. Uh, until then, See you in a couple of days.